So it's the middle class and the poor people who are paying the taxes, and that sustains the economy such as it is, and the rich people keep amassing more and more wealth. That's a broken system, and it is not sustainable. So as it becomes more apparent that uh, increasing levels of inequality only lead to civil unrest, uh, then these things start to get reversed. As you consume news, it's very easy to go, oh, we live in a terrible world, oh, things are getting worse. But actually, if you look at the data, we've never had it this good. People were far healthier, life expectancies were better, poverty levels were down, education levels are up. We've never had it in the history of the planet. We've never, ever, ever had it this good. And you know what? It's only getting better. Thank you for joining India's Forest Speech Tech Podcast. And I'm your host, Eddie Atty. If today I have the Mr. Tom Rafferty, who's the Global VP for SAP. He's an innovation evangelist, futurist, keynote speaker, and host of the Climate 21 and Digital Supply Chain Podcast. Tom also is a regular guest lecturer at the International Institute of San Telmo Business School in Seven. Tom, it's a pleasure and honor to have you on Change and Possible Podcast. A humble effort to educate people and bring awareness of what the fourth industrial revolution is or what technology is doing to mankind. So uh, I am really excited for the future, but then there's one side of me which is really scared, you know, because there's genetic editing, we're kind of playing the, with the source code of uh, uh, life, then there's brain computer interface where people like Moodle Link, uh, Facebook's control lab, and then Brian Johnson's kernel are trying to kind of create a symbiosis between a human and machine by creating a, a, a interface then there is virtual reality which i've been invested in since since early 2016 and i guess we are just scratching the surface with all these technologies all these technologies are so so potential that once it matures it could either transform mankind for the good or completely completely disrupt mankind and, and, and I think the choice uh, is in our hand. So how excited are you for a technology as a futurist and how scared are you for the growth of exponential technology? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm incredibly excited. Uh, I am an optimist by nature. Um, I look at where technology is going and what it has done for us over the last number of years. And, you know, when you project that forward, it's all good. Sure, I can understand people's concerns because if you take a, a kind of a micro view and, and look at some of the bad things that have happened as a result of technology, and there have been several, uh, you can certainly think, oh my gosh, this is terrible. You know, X could happen or Y could happen. Uh, you just have to look at the way the American elections, for example, uh, in 2016 and the Brexit vote in the UK were usurped by social media. Um, but when you, when you see how that can happen and then you look at the 2020 election in, in the US and see how it corrected and you you go forward and you see all of these things as they progress they take a, a typical kind of arc of progress is you know two three steps forward then one step back then another two steps forward then one step back as i mentioned poverty levels are are, are way way down child mortality levels are you know way 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 down as well the, the progress we've made over the last number of decades and centuries has been incredible thanks to technology and technological breakthroughs. And uh, it, it will continue apace. Uh, as I mentioned, there will be bumps along the path, but the, the overall arc is up and to the right. Even I'm very optimistic about where the technology is going. But yes, there are these isolated players or nations who understand that in the next 10 years, with the next coming decade, technology is going to be akin to magic. You know, uh, most of the countries are trying to catch on or hold on to the technologies because if you get those technologies, it will get you and uh, give you an unfair advantage. And we humans have never been good in 
uh, with, with power. So that, that there's one side of me which is a little afraid on how we will be managing such a transformational tool which we which we'll have, we'll have in the uh, hands in, in, in the next coming decade. And one side of me would be very optimistic because where do you think or you see India going in the next 10 years? If you as a futurist were to predict a roadmap for India, how would you paint the picture? I don't know is, is the short answer. Um, I don't know enough about India, frankly, to, to give any good predictions or projections. Um, I would say India has an enormous population, almost as much as China. Uh, there is a high level of youth in that population. It's, it's, it's As far as I know, it's quite a young population. And this means the country has enormous potential. To my knowledge, the youth in India are reasonably well-educated as well. Uh, and many speak English. You know, r- right there, you've got the makings of a phenomenal economy moving forward. I- India has been blighted by poverty, a lot of that due to the colonial nature of your history. Uh, unfortunately. Um, But India is starting to rise. Uh, India is going to be one of the powerhouses, along with Africa and parts of South America, I think, and China probably in the coming decades. So I think India has got a very bright future. Uh, One thing India needs to do uh, to ensure that is to solve the issues it has right now with pollution, with air pollution in particular. Uh, And a lot of that will be solved if India uh, leapfrogs the kind of the current electrical or electricity generation um, uh, methodologies, the the ones that have worked in the West uh, and go, you know, a skip coal and go straight to renewables. Uh, India has a big coal fleet at the moment that needs to to shut down. Uh, One advantage of shutting down the coal fleet is that India won't be as reliant as it is right now on imports of coal. Uh, If India is relying on renewables for generation, then the energy import issue goes away. Um, So, and as well as the pollution. And of course, it means a big uptick in the number of jobs building out renewable power plants. I know India is doing some of that already, and there's a proposal to put a 35 gigawatt generation facility in Gujarat, for example. Uh, And 35 gigawatts for for context is about the output of 30 nuclear power plants. So that's a huge, huge undertaking. And the other way to tackle uh, air quality issues is to get rid of uh, internal combustion engine vehicles and replace them with electric vehicles. And that's going to happen as well, I, I would hope, in India. Um, I know there are some initiatives there. I saw something recently that the mayor of Delhi said that all the uh, vehicles in Delhi would be, all the, all the city-owned vehicles in Delhi would be replaced by electric vehicles by, I think he said, 2024. So that that's quite ambitious and that's great to hear. More initiatives like that are needed, obviously. Uh, subsidies are needed to help people pay for electric vehicles and infrastructure needs to be rolled out to help people charge electric vehicles. So, and, and you know, th- those kinds of projects will lead to investment and will lead to creation of jobs as well. So you're doing multiple things. You're stimulating the economy, you're cleaning up the air, uh, and you're helping people move around in in a more efficient manner. There's a large number of the the youth population. They do speak in English. And and thanks to this company called Geo, I mean, I must tell you about this. It's it's, it's a telecom company. And thanks to them, they had the vision. They they dropped down the price of mobiles and internet, and I guess after that, suddenly we transitioned into this. Uh, uh, you know, everybody was connected, and I guess uh, you know what connectivity brought to us is information, and we could connect with anyone and everyone. And I guess we are getting into a very hyper connected world, and internet. It is one of the biggest teachers in the world. And I mean, there's a huge repository of education over there. And then there's this other side of education, 
which is charging a bomb, you know, when everything is available free on the net in the forms of massive open online courses. It's just that what, what what's not there is awareness. People don't really know. So, so I'm really excited about all of these converging and technology also growing. Uh, you mentioned about air pollution. Yes, India suffers from it terribly. Bombay, Delhi, Bangalore, the air is filled with smog and icy vehicles. It is definitely res- partly responsible for what, what has happened. Uh, you also host the Climate 21 podcast. Would you like to kind of explain to my audience how urgent is the global warming problem at this point in time? And the clean energy revolution, how can we kind of save ourselves from this impending future? Sure. Of By extracting fossil fuels and burning them, we generate carbon dioxide, which goes into the atmosphere, traps heat, and causes the planet to warm up. This is something that has been happening over uh, decades and centuries. Uh, in At the start of the Industrial Revolution, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was 250 parts per million. So... That's kind of the baseline. It had been at roughly 250 parts per million for essentially thousands of years. And then the Industrial Revolution started and we started burning coal and um, oil and petrol and diesel and all the other fossil fuels after that. And the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere kept increasing and increasing and increasing. And now it's at around 415 parts per million where it should be at 250. And that number goes up every year and it, it, it's seasonal. So it goes up and down with the seasons. But, it, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the Keeling curve, it continues to go up and up every year. And as it goes up, it traps more heat and that more heat warms the planet and causes all kinds of climatic disasters. Uh, and it causes uh, biological systems to change, you know, biological systems which are based on a stable temperature over thousands of years are suddenly, suddenly those temperatures and that climate is no longer stable. Um, You know, uh, you you see all kinds of weird things happening. Uh, Cities in Africa that were built above the mosquito line suddenly find the mosquito line. This is how high up on hills mosquitoes can go because of the temperature drops when they get above a certain height. Suddenly that line goes above the line where the city is and the city becomes invaded by mosquitoes. There are all kinds of weird things like that that starts to happen. How do we fix that problem? Well, it's very, very difficult because most of our economies are based on consumption, creation and consumption of stuff. uh, And a lot of that creation of stuff uses fossil fuels to create. Our transportation is based on fossil fuels as well, as I mentioned. So it's very difficult to change, but we've got to change it. Uh, The good news is that, for example, the generation of electricity, which has traditionally been done by burning coal or oil or gas, you know, these fossil fuels, that is now cheaper to do with renewables than it is with fossil fuels. So economics are starting to kick in. The cost of solar power, the cost of wind power has fallen enormously in the last 10 years. Uh, Cost of Solar has dropped by nearly 90% in the last 10 years, and the cost of wind has dropped over 50% in the last 10 years. And this is down to uh, economies of scale and what's called the learning curve or the experience curve. So as you start to do something, you learn how to do it better, you do it better, you learn more, and you get better and better, and the price of production keeps falling. The, of course, that leads to a beautiful, virtuous circle because as the price falls, it becomes more affordable to more people, more people purchase it, which, you know, again, increases the learning curve and the economies of scale, which drops the price even further, which means more people can afford it and so on and so on. And then we have um, lithium ion battery storage as well. The cost of that has fallen over 90% in the last 10 years and continues to fall. And the energy density of those lithium-ion batteries increases. And those lithium-ion batteries can be used 
you know, in our phones, in our laptops, but also can be used increasingly in our vehicles. Instead of burning petrol or diesel or gas, we can now use batteries in our vehicles. We store the energy in the batteries and use that to, to move the wheels, uh, electric vehicles. Uh, and electric motorbikes, electric tuk-tuks, all these kind of things are becoming electrified, which makes them cleaner and more efficient. And the batteries can also be used on grids. So uh, famously, renewables are variable electricity generators. You know, they go up and down as the wind blows and the sun shines. Uh, but to smoothen out though that variability, you can use batteries. So you add in batteries to the mix of renewables and when the wind drops a little bit, the energy that you've stored in the batteries can be drawn from to make sure that you've got a nice consistent flow of energy coming out of any solar or wind farm. So the, the problem, the climate problem, is a huge, huge problem, and it's going to take decades to solve, if not longer. But we will solve it. We've got the, uh, we've got the brain power to do it. We've got the technologies to do it increasingly we we have the will to do it political will is starting to move in this direction as well again it has been a bumpy road uh, we have had politicians like donald trump who fortunately we've just seen leave uh, he was very anti-climate but he's been replaced by joe biden who is very pro-climate and i think uh, that is a huge step forward because a lot of the announcements that he has made around things that his government are going to do are very, very positive. Similarly, in the EU, the EU has made some incredible commitments uh, to, for example, reduce by 50% its uh, CO2 output by 2030. So, you know, that, that, that's a huge undertaking. China has said it's going, and, and the EU has said it's going to go uh, net zero by 2050. China has said they're going to go net zero by 2060. Uh, America has committed to 2050. So when you see these big economies committing to these net zero goals, the only way they're going to get there is to have massive rollout of renewable technologies. And so that's a huge demand signal for the producers of these technologies. Uh, so, you know, everything is rolling in the right direction. And then if you look at the investment community who are incredibly important in this space, because you have all these governmental commitments, the investment community are looking at this carefully and they're seeing that fossil fuel projects are now starting to become stranded assets. And, and we've seen, for example, Larry Fink, who is the CEO of BlackRock, the largest investment uh, company in the world. He, he writes a, an annual letter to global CEOs. And in his letter this year, he was very forthcoming, saying, you need to be reporting on all your emissions, and we are only going to be investing in projects that are low carbon. So when you've got the huge investment community, you know, the people who control the money, when they're looking at low carbon as the more attractive investment opportunities, that's a huge signal that we're going in the right direction. At least from my perspective here in Bombay, you know, it, it looks quite bad. You know, I mean, the reason I say this is because I have a six-year-old born. He's, a, he's got a wheezing problem. And, and, I, uh, the, the place where I live, there's some around 30 odd buildings, and uh, most of the kids have wheezing problem because of the the, the environment, and, and it is such uh, a problem which needs to be addressed urgently. But somehow there is, I see lack of a concerted effort, you know, from the government or the powers that be, because some of the top global oil and gas companies at this point of time are still churning out fossil fuel and this is happening with the support of the government. On the other hand, you saw that, you know, that there are these entrepreneurs, brave entrepreneurs who are putting money where the mouth is, you know, Elon Musk recently put in a hundred billion dollar fund for, for XPRIZE, you know, for carbon removal. How realistic is something like that? Is, is that possible? Can you well, pull out carbon from air. What other efforts you think can be or should be done to reverse the global climate problem? Yeah, it is, I mean, it is technically feasible to pull carbon out of the air. I mean, it, it makes up, as I said, 400 parts per million of uh, all the air that we breathe. Um, 
it being technically feasible doesn't mean it's economically feasible. And that's the big problem. Uh, the current technologies we have for removing carbon from the atmosphere uh, can do so, but don't do so in a way that's very cost efficient. So what we need to do is come up with technologies which can extract carbon from the air uh, in a more efficient manner. Um, trees are very good at it, for example. Uh, but And if trees can do it, there's no reason we can't. We just have to figure out how. That's something we're good at. Uh, and you're right, Elon Musk has put up a hundred million dollars through the X Prize Foundation. Elon Musk is not alone in this. Uh, on my Climate 21 podcast uh, a few weeks ago, I interviewed Lucas Joppa. Lucas is the chief environmental officer of Microsoft. And Lucas talked about the one billion dollars that Microsoft have set aside in a venture fund to fund people coming up with ways of, reduce, of getting CO2 out of the air. Why are Microsoft doing it? Well, Microsoft, their attitude is they want to have consumers around buying their products. And if we have a healthy, stable climate with healthy, stable people in it, then they will be able to buy Microsoft's products. So that's Microsoft's game. They say, this is something we want to do. We want to make sure that the planet stays safe and stable and allows people to buy our products. So we're going to invest in this space. They have committed to uh, going net zero and then by to go carbon negative uh, and they want to by 2050 have removed all the carbon from the atmosphere that they have ever produced since they started operating in 1975 so to do that they need to there needs to be some way to get carbon out of the atmosphere feasibly and economically uh, and because currently there's very few ways of doing that, they've put forward this one, this fund of one billion dollars to seed the market, to create the market, to encourage people to come up with ways of doing this. They have also put out a request for tender for one million tons of CO2. So right there, that's an initiative for someone who can come up with a million tons of CO2 removed from the air to be paid for it by Microsoft. And, and th this, this will increasingly be a thing as we move forward because, because we have to, because we won't have a livable planet if we don't. Yeah, I, I think that's so profound. We won't have a livable planet if we don't kind of come together collectively. There are billionaires right now, I mean, such as Elon Musk and Microsoft and so many others who understand that, you know, the only way to create an equitable future is, is when everybody is happy, but somehow capitalism is, is kind of killing uh, the society. You know, it, it, there is a growing inequality and, and and the problem of, of global warming seems to be connected. You know, if, if you want to create a, like a sustainable future uh, or a circular economy, we need to relook at capitalism uh, in itself because it's, it's a zero sum game over there. Is a sustainable or equitable future a possibility? And how do you think and what would be the ways to get to something like that? Yeah, I think a sustainable future is a possibility, absolutely. Um, and I think we are kind of getting there. Um, we're getting there in that we're lifting the bottom half of society up. The number of people who are in absolute poverty has fallen enormously in the last century. Uh, so we have raised enormously the, the, the levels uh, of income that people have, but at the same time, to your point, inequality has increased as well. Uh, and by that, I mean, we have more billionaires now than we ever had before. And in some cases, the number of billions of dollars that they have is just, it's 
for want of a better word, it's sickening. It really is. I mean, uh, how could you ever spend one billion dollars? Never mind hundreds of billions that some of these people have. Um, a lot of that has arisen in the U.S. Uh, to a lesser extent in China and some in Russia um, through various different means in uh, places like Russia. Some of it could be down to, uh, well, there's a lot of hidden wealth there, um, which has come through various means, which wouldn't be entirely legal, I suspect. Uh, in America, a lot of it has come from what is known as trickle-down economics. This is the idea that if you let the rich people get richer, they'll spend their money and that'll trickle down to the people who are lower down the ladder and bring them up as well, which has been massively debunked, uh, hasn't proven to be the case. But what it has meant is that people who are wealthy in America spend their money making sure that other rich people get elected to uh, positions of power and they perpetuate the system that allows rich people to get richer by not taxing rich people. So it's the middle class and the poor people who are paying the taxes and that sustains the economy such as it is and the rich people keep amassing more and more wealth. That's a broken system and it is not sustainable by definition. Uh, and I think that will change too, because it has to, because it's not sustainable. So as it becomes more apparent that uh, increasing levels of inequality only lead to civil unrest, uh, then these things start to get reversed. It's again a question of taking a step back and taking a macro look at what's going on rather than just focusing in on what's happened in the last number of weeks and months and years, but taking a decadal view on things. And when you do that, you start to see that, yes, to my earlier point, it's like that keeling curve, it's a sawtooth up and to the right. Talking about clean energy. Now, do you think the clean energy revolution will drive the future of mobility? Um, I do, absolutely, because we are going to a world of the electrification of transport and we are going to a world of the decarbonization of electricity. So the two things, hand in hand, means that our transport will be, will our transport will happen as a result of clean electricity. Um, and again, this is down to economics. Um Renewable energy is cheaper to uh, build out and it's cheaper to produce than fossil fuel energy now. Uh, and that's getting and it's getting cheaper all the time. And electric vehicles are still their upfront cost is a little higher than uh, fossil fuel vehicles, but the tendency of the price is downwards. The prices are due to cross over, depending on vehicle category, but they're due to cross over 2023 kind of a time frame. And after that, they will be cheaper at the upfront cost. But the operational cost of electric vehicles is already far cheaper than the operational cost of fossil fuel vehicles because the, the fuel that you use in a, an electric vehicle electricity is far cheaper per mile than petrol or diesel. Uh, and then there's the cost of maintenance. The cost of maintenance of an electric vehicle is at least half, if not less, than the cost of maintenance of a fossil fuel vehicle. A typical uh, fossil fuel vehicle has about 2,000 moving parts in its drivetrain. A typical electrical vehicle has about 20 moving parts in its drivetrain. So, you know, that's 1,880 fewer moving parts that need to be lubricated that can break down in an electric vehicle. So it, the electric vehicles are very, very, very simple devices. They don't break down. They don't need maintenance and fueling them is incredibly cheap. So they are absolutely the, the future of transportation.
we're getting into the electric vehicle from there, maybe solar vehicle, not autonomous vehicle. The future looks really, really exciting. You know, and it's not just these electric vehicles. The, the future of mobility itself is so exciting. You know, there are people who are working on Hyperloop and EV tolls and things like that. Now, uh, would you like to talk about your podcast? You host two podcasts, the Climate 21 and the Digital Supply Chain Podcast. What has been the learning? Would you like to see? Yeah, the Digital Supply Chain Podcast is the podcast I, I run around the digitization of supply chains. Supply chains have really come to the fore since the start of the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, a lot of organizations viewed supply chains as a cost center, uh, as a a place where you can try and cut costs uh, and by doing so, you know, be more efficient. Uh, But of course, when the pandemic happened and supply chains broke, all over the world, it was the supply chains that were more digitized that proved to be more resilient to the breakage. Uh, And consequently, now uh, organizations are seeing supply chains as not a cost center, but rather a strategic differentiator, uh, a place where if you have a resilient sustainable supply chain, it is a competitive differentiator. Um, And typically I have people on the Digital Supply Chain podcast who are professionals in supply chain coming from the company I work for, which is SAP, or from customer organizations, or from partner companies, or from companies who are in the supply chain ecosystem Uh, There might be startups or whatever, talking about ways that they have managed to digitize their supply chains or uh, successful projects that they have rolled out or new best practices in supply chain and the digitization of supply chain, whether it's digitizing the planning process. Because in in SAP, we, we look at supply chain as the whole thing, the all aspects of your supply chain, everything from the engineering of the device at the start where you're, you know, figuring out how to make what it is you're going to make. So that entire engineering process, we have software to help with that. Many of our customers are now heading into what's called the outcome economy, where they're not actually selling the devices they make, they're giving away the devices they make, and they're charging for their usage. So it's the outcome economy or product as a service, as it's sometimes called. So how do you see digital transformation or digitization transforming enterprise? The biggest one is the ability to go into, as I, as I mentioned, the product as a service route, the outcome economy. Now, that's hugely important because um, it allows organizations to get a steady stream of income for the things that they manufacture. The old way of doing things was I would make a widget whatever that widget is, I would make it, I would sell it, I would get a one-time fee, and that's it. But as we head into more digital products, it's important to maintain and improve those products during their lifetime and then to take them back and recycle and reuse them and then output a new product, an even better one, and then get income from that product through its life because as we as so instead of selling it and getting a one off fee we give it away and we get a rental fee from it through its life and because we maintain ownership of that device whatever it is it is in our best interest to make sure that that device never stops working and works for as long as possible So the old way of doing something, make it, sell it, forget about it, means that it is very much in my interest as a manufacturer to build obsolescence into that device so that it fails quickly, so that my customer has to come back and get another one. So I make another sale. Whereas when we go to the outcome economy, it's very much in my interest as a manufacturer to make sure that whatever it is I've manufactured has the longest life possible because I don't want it failing because if it fails, I'm no longer getting revenue from it. Rather, I want it to have the longest life possible 
so that I, I keep getting income from it. And because it's got a digital connection back to me, it's sending me back information at all times so I can bill for how much it is being used. But also, I can take the information coming back from it to know if it is going to fail. So if it is going to fail, I can send an engineer out to replace or repair it to make sure that my income stream is not put in any danger. And also, I can take the data coming back from it and feed that back into my research and development organization so they can see how my devices are actually being used in the wild and better engineer the next version so that it has an even longer lifetime in the wild. That's a big movement we're, we're heading towards. The, the whole outcome economy, which makes things, devices, uh, digital, connected, constantly sending data back with a very, very long lifespan. Uh, and so they're highly, highly sustainable and they're built to be that way. And then they're built to be taken back, reused and recycled at end of life and sent back out again. I think we're getting into a world where anything and everything which is physical is going to get digitized. There's going to be sensors everywhere, which is going to give us information. We're going to take that information and back, make better and better and better and better product. So I'm, I'm super excited for all of these technologies which are converging. Now, you know, there has always been a, a, this thing, you know, like common thing, you know, where people are asking, you know, all these technology, obviously it's really good. You know, there is artificial intelligence and whatever. But how do you see that helping the common man? And, and how do you see technology improving the world in, in this decade? The common man can now, for example, very, very, very likely afford a smartphone, which is something that no one could have dreamt of being able to afford 10, 15 years ago. So right there, that is one technological advancement the, that has helped democratize technology. Uh, making it available to almost anyone. Uh, it, it means people who were formerly unbanked, for example, can now have a bank account because there are many new companies coming up, setting up mobile phone first bank accounts. So not even having to go and have a physical bank, but just setting up through an app, a bank account. So uh, other things, the outcome economy that I talked about, means many people will never need to, to buy a car because more and more car manufacturers are going to go to that product as a service route that I mentioned. So instead of selling cars, they will rent cars. So rather than having to spend uh, 15, 20,000 euro to at the high end, 70, 80,000 euro, instead of having to spend that, I can go to a, the, the Volkswagen website, for example. Volkswagen here in Spain have an offer to rent their vehicles. So you can rent their new electric ID3 for 400 euros a month, for example. And for that 400 euros a month, you get to drive 12,000 kilometers a year. You get all your maintenance covered. You get all your insurance covered. You get all your road tax covered. You get the management of any tolls or any fines. You know, they handle all that for you for a one set fee of 400 euros a month. It means you never own the car, but it means you never have any problems if it's involved in an accident. They handle all that. Uh, you never have any problems uh, forgetting to get the insurance or you don't have to ring around multiple insurance. All of that is covered for you as well. Um, so it, it, it's a very attractive way to do it. And it also starts to make transportation more affordable. Uh, you're probably seeing it in uh, India as well. The tuk-tuks there are starting to go electric. Um, they as well, the electric ones are obviously quieter and cleaner. Uh, and they're also cheaper to operate. So there's going to be more of that kind of thing happen there as well, I suspect. Uh, so transportation will be cheaper because it will be the, you know, transportation as a service or mobility as a service rather than having to invest and buy an actual vehicle. And there are lots of examples of that. That's going to happen in healthcare. It's going to happen in lots of other places. Right. Yeah, it's, it's an exciting space. You know, it like you said, it won't make sense economically to 
actually acquire a product, but you'll be able to use it, you know, and, and take all, 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 all the benefits. And, and it, it, thanks to internet, you know, it has already democratized knowledge. You know, like I mentioned earlier, there's a repository of knowledge. I mean, I call it the biggest teacher because, you know, whatever you want, it's already there. You know, you don't need to spend it for those high degrees and stuff like that. Your education is available free online in the form of moves. It's only thing that's stopping you is the desire and intent, you know. So any last words to my listeners or, or you know, advice to entrepreneurs? I think the, the, the last thing I would say is it's very very easy um, reading the news or listening to news stories to get depressed about where things are going. But you have to remember, there's a saying in the media, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, you don't hear good news stories very often in the news because they don't grab attention the way bad news stories do. You know, you don't, it's very rare to hear a headline, the head, the, the, the top story in the news is never a good news story ever uh, or in the newspapers or anything like that no news website leads with the, the, the good news story it just doesn't happen so as you consume news it's very easy to go oh we live in a terrible world oh things are getting worse but actually if you look at the data we've never had it this good you know global poverty levels are down uh, Vaccination levels, even before the pandemic, global vaccination levels were way up. People were far healthier. Life expectancies were better. Poverty levels were down. Education levels are up. We've never had it in the history of the planet. We've never, ever, ever had it this good. And you know what? It's only getting better. There are bumps along the road, as I mentioned earlier. Sure, it's like that sawtooth I mentioned earlier. Yeah, it is. But take a step back. Take a macro look. And we have never had it this good and we'll never have it this bad again. Right. Yeah. We have one note to end on, Tom. Really appreciate you talking and, and sharing your insight. Yes, I think we're living in fantastic times. And though the, the COVID pandemic has been like a minor roadblock, but if you see through history, I mean, you know, there has been pandemics which has completely caused, caused huge disruption. We are almost come out of it. And, and, and somehow... I, I think in the next few years, when all of these technologies starts maturing, we are going to enter the future of abundance. You know, where the the uh, the notion of scarcity just might vanish. You know, because all of mm -hmm. these technologies, we we are playing with the tools which could actually, you know, 3D print food for us, you know, we are getting into nanotechnology, we, we, are, we are getting into so many good things which could like completely transform mankind. So I'm super excited about where we are going. And that's the reason I, I, I do what I'm doing. This podcast it is like a conduit for me to kind of share information, have conversations with people like yourself and kind of make people understand that we are living in fantastic times and there is so much opportunity which is there you know you, you know not just for the urbanites but even the, the people who are living in the most rural part you know all that we need is connectivity and, and a desire to kind of you know change things and if you have that we can reach out to pe people around the world and 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 People are really receptive. I mean, the reason I'm having a conversation because you are receptive to having me uh, having a conversation, you know, together. And, and and this internet has made this possible. And, and I, if we come together, I think we can create a fantastic future. You know, and, and that's the reason I'm super excited. So thank you for sharing insights. And to my listeners, if you'd like to see and hear, please press the subscribe button. Maybe next time, see you guys. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Really appreciate this. Thank you, Eddie. Thanks for having me.